Hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our webinar today, Five Steps to Getting Your Nonprofit Cloud Ready. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, feel free to use the chat box that you should see on your left-hand side to ask questions. Um, all callers will be muted, so uh, we won't be able to hear you. So um, use the chat box as much as, as much as you'd like during the webinar. If you lose your Internet connection, um, reconnect using the link that was emailed to you. You can also try refreshing your browser um, and logging in again if, if that doesn't work. And then if you want to watch the webinar um, again, or if you have to leave a little bit early, the webinar will be hosted on the TechSoup website at TechSoup.org slash community slash events dash webinars. We'll also be sending an email with the presentation, um, with the recording, and any relevant links. And if you are on social media, feel free to send us a tweet at TechSoup using hashtag TSWebinars. Um, but like I said earlier, if you want to use a Q&A, that's what we'll be monitoring throughout the conversation. Um, so just a little bit about TechSoup. We are in uh, 263 countries and territories, um, and we serve over a million nonprofits. So just to kind of make sure that you guys can um, hear me okay and you can use the Q&A box if you guys want to chat in where you're calling in from, <clears throat> and I can read out a few of those. So we have Utah, Evansville, Indiana, <clears throat> Boulder, Waco, Chicago, San Francisco, somebody nearby, uh, Houston, Texas. All right, so it looks like you guys are calling in from um, all over the country, and I don't see any uh, international yet, but hopefully there's people calling in from all over the world. Uh, so just um, a little bit about our technology partners. We work with uh, companies like Adobe, Intuit, Microsoft, Symantec. They make our you know, mission possible so that we can offer technology either at a discounted um, or donated uh, price. If you're interested in learning more about what technology we offer um, in addition to the ones that I just mentioned, you can go to our website, TechSoup.org slash get-product-donations, and you can explore based on um, your technology needs what we have available to you. So um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, the people on the call today. So myself, my name is Seema. I'm the online learning producer here at TechSoup. We have Lashika Phillips who is going to be monitoring the chat box. You might be seeing her name already. And then we have our presenter, Michael Enos. So Michael Enos is the Senior Director of Community and Platform for TechSoup Global. Michael directs DevOps, Enterprise Infrastructure, Information and Technology Security, and software development teams that build and support platform products and services. Michael Eno's professional career in technology began in 1996, beginning as a system admin for a Bay Area nonprofit that served adults in needs. He transitioned into a role as a technical consultant developing data systems to help measure and track service quality to the individuals being served. Uh, Michael was also hired at Second Harvest Food Bank of Santa Clara and San Mateo Counties in 2000 to manage technology and information systems. He helped transform the organization into a more effective enterprise using sophisticated technology to efficiently distribute food, uh, communicate, raise money, and measure the food bank's impact. As CTO, he also worked at a national level with other enterprise food banks on developing IT best practices and standards as part of the Feeding America Technology Governance Team. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Michael. Great. Hello everyone, and um, thanks very much for uh, joining us today on this call. Um, I'm very excited to be presenting this topic uh, in my roles, uh, previous roles both working at uh, Second Harvest and also as a consultant and a volunteer for local nonprofits in my community. I helped, I've helped uh, organizations as you know, prepare for cloud, um, hands-on helped you know organizations move to the cloud. Did you know? And coming to TechSoup four years ago, in my role, I'm helping our organization um, move the many systems that provide services to to our community, to our community, and also our corporate systems uh, to cloud-based systems. Uh, what we're going to talk about today, uh, we're going to talk about uh, essentially what you know, what is cloud readiness? Essentially, we're going to talk about how it is to prepare your organization at a, at a high level um, for, you know, to develop cloud strategy, to uh, get buy-in, um, to, to create an implementation plan, uh, to understand what is like, you know, what you need to go live, 
and then also how this is sort of a, a you know as a learn you know if you want to be a if your organization wants to be a learning organization how this is an inter iterative process so we're going to go through this in five steps but first we're going to talk a little bit about cloud readiness so when 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 we talk about cloud readiness we're talking about essentially the preparation which which includes some of these steps they include many steps but see these are some of the main steps that are included First of all, there's, there's analysis that's involved in cloud readiness. There's a certain amount of uh, you know, subject matter expertise that people under, need to understand the business functions of an organization and, and analyze those biz, business functions and how uh, you know, a strategy to move those business functions to the cloud can be aligned with business goals of the organization. It's also going to involve uh, budgeting and approvals. Um, and a lot of the work that's done in cloud readiness is essentially from a high-level strategic perspective is to have an end goal of improving the security, the performance, and availability of technology services while reducing the overhead and costs and all of this through web-based services. And so that's sort of a summary of when I'm thinking about what is, uh, you know, the, the first part of that is about what IT, IT organization, you know, serves to function in an organization is, is essentially you know, improving the security performance and availability of services. Um, and then also, you know, because of, because of the cloud, we have an opportunity to do that through, uh, through web-based services, and we'll talk more about that. So that's a little bit about cloud readiness. So one of the first steps when we, when we consider cloud readiness, well, let me first talk about our journey, and then, then we'll move into the, uh, so the, the steps. So um, I've been with Tech TechSoup for four years now, um, and however, the, the TechSoup's journey began in, in 2010 with some high-level visioning that was done in terms of how to move our on-premise systems um, and also our corporate business systems um, to the cloud, essentially, to better serve our community. Um, one, one of the things we did as part of that was we transitioned our financial system and our ERP system to the cloud in, in 2012, and we're leveraging NetSuite for that. I know a lot of the organizations we serve and some of the ones that I've worked with have you know, transitioning to uh, uh, QuickBooks Online, and, and, uh, you know, which is, and I've helped organizations do that as well. Lots of different choices for, for some of these transitions. Um, we also began leveraging Amazon Web Services and Microsoft Azure for cloud-based infrastructure. Uh, Amazon Web Services, we started earlier first, and around 2013, we started moving some of, the, um, some of our websites and some of our brochure sites and some of our uh, assets essentially of our portfolio to infrastructure as a service to reduce overhead on our um, <clears throat> to, to reduce overhead <clears throat> and for us to be a little bit more lean. We started using uh, cloud-based customer service technology, Zendesk and 20. These are just some examples. Uh, other services were actively used are Box for document management, Slack for internal chat. Um, we've recently, just last year, moved our on-premise, what was our premise call center solution. Um, which manages the call center, which you know some of our members call into, to to Ring Central, and that's just one example of what we've been doing as part of our transformation. And right now, our digital transformation is still in flight. Right now, we're uh, moving a lot of uh, the information systems out of our data centers into into Azure uh, to to leverage infrastructure as a service there. So, step one: the importance of having a technology plan. One thing to be clear, when I've, yeah, I've developed a lot of technology plans for organizations or helped them to over the years, and <clears throat> you know, t the, the way this has looked has changed radically over the years. You know, 15 years ago, if I was to develop a technology plan, I would say, when I first came to Second Harvest Food Bank, uh, <clears throat> the first thing I did was develop a five-year technology plan um, because there was going to be a significant amount of work that needed to be done to transform that organization as that organization we knew was going to be growing to, uh, you, you know, 10% year over year in terms of providing food to the community. So to that extent, it was sort of a lofty sort of, you know, what we'd call back then a, a waterfall project, where what we'd, what we'd want to do is essentially plan everything out, get everything sort of lined up. It was a, you know, huge exercise, um, and it was a very long throw, as we say. So, and the intention, you know, it, however, nowadays, Technology is moving so quickly, five years is, is really too long of a window to think about a technology plan. And so <clears throat> what I'm going to be I'm talking about in just a moment here is about how that's changed. But 
one of the reasons why, first I want to talk about the purpose of a technology plan. The purpose is really to provide leadership with estimated financial projections and results um, at, and outcomes. So essentially, you know, we, we want to be able to know for an organization, for budgeting, for resource allocation, for business strategy purposes, we want to know how much money we'll need, um, what's it going to look like, how is that going to improve the security performance and availability of the services that technology is providing, how is it going to, in, in mostly which is sometimes difficult to measure, how is it going to change our impact, how is it going to improve our impact. Um, if you have impact measurements and you can tie them to a technology strategy, that's, that, that's golden. Um, the other thing is to, part of this is really understanding the business goals. So the technology leaders in the organization really have to be sort of sitting at the ta same table with the business leaders and talk about how uh, technology strategy can align with business goals, especially when we, when we think about cloud migration strategies and business functions moving to the cloud. Um, so, in, but in, you know, a couple important components here is that this is, my recommendation is that this is a broad vision, that uh, for the technology plan itself, that we don't look to, you know, we, we're not actually solutioning at this point. Um, what we're doing is we're actually saying, you know, we're thinking, we're painting with a broad brush. We're saying, uh, look, these are the technology goals we have. You know, ours were, are things like, you know, that we want to move to, um, a, we want to have a more secure system that pr protects data, data privacy better. We want it to be cloud-based. Uh, we want it to have uh, higher availability. We want it to be more, more resilient. Uh, these are the, so these are outcome metrics that are associated at the technology planning stage. And then you go to the solution and such afterwards, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So the other um, thing, as I stress, is I think that you know, my recommendation is that when we think about technology plan, we actually look at like 18-month what we call sprint. So this is an idea in software development to move things into shorter, more digestible sort of periods of time. You know, software development sprints are you know, some, somewhere between six weeks and you know, two months. But when we're thinking about something like this, you know, we can kind of consider an 18 month to, to two year sort of sprint, meaning that's about how long it takes to get something done. That's a technology migration project, but also a short enough window that you know the t technology might not change you know, with, within that period of time. Um, the other key component is to, you know, identify what you expect to be the rough estimate of cost based on resource needs and additional headcounts, if needed. And that that is important as part of the technology plan because it gives the the leaders of the organization, the business leaders, a, a chance to sort of see how this fits in with other planning projects and also with growth ex expectations, and other aspects of the organization, um, the the overall organization goals. Another important aspect is to differentiate capital expenses from operating expenses. And this is really important as it pertains to cloud migration strategy because as we've been moving systems and resource technical resources to the cloud, oftentimes the costs then move from a financial perspective from the capital budget to an operating expense budget because now we're looking at subscription-based services. Back, you know, 15 years ago when we were looking at a technology plan, I'd say, look, we need to build a new data center. It's going to cost us this amount of money in servers and hardware and software. We're going to all land at once. That's going to be amortized over a period of time. Now what we're doing is we're saying, okay, all that stuff, we want all that stuff. It's been 10 years now. That stuff is sort of at end of life. Now let's move to the cloud. Now it's going to hit our month-to-month -month operating expense budget. That's really important to lay out because that changes the financial modeling of an organization from a financial perspective. What, I've, what I have here in this slide, and this is sort of a, just a broad picture, this is an internal document that I did uh, a couple years ago now, but it was when I was formulating what is now, you know, we're at the tail end of our sort of this, this two-year process and beginning another one um, as we speak actually for, this next, for the next two-year vision. Um, and so this outlines a bunch of different things that we have, which we've characterized as either products, uh, <clears throat> projects, or functions. Uh, most of the things that are on here, and because this is, you know, this is a larger sort of portfolio view of TechSoup as, as an enterprise, and so we, we develop products we, that serve you, products and services that serve our, our, our members in our community. And then sometimes we have projects which are you know, relative to uh, just something that needs to get done, but it's not really necessary that's mapped to a technology strategy. Um, then we have functions, and most of these functions here are areas where we said, oh, let's take this business function and let's move it to the cloud. And, uh, or let's, let's, let's develop it as a service in, in, the, in the cloud. So 
Um, and it's, it's a Gantt. Um, it separates out the product, the platform, or service, the initiative that ties to the initiative is what should tie to a strategy plan. And then it shows sort of a roadmap. And then um, we'll talk about some of the thinking next about what it for each one of these. So each one of these sort of things becomes essentially a separate pro project or initiative or an outcome that needs to be reached. And so for each one of these, we want to break it out into an implementation plan. And that's going to be the next step once you have, once you have approvals, essentially, or once you have buy-in for the, the, the technology um, plan. So this is step two. So you've, you know, you've got sort of a plan in place. Um, you've socialized it. You said this is what we're going to do over the next two years or three years, or <coughs> two years preferably. Uh, that's my recommendation. Um, but some, that can, you know, that it depends on your organization. Um, the next step really is to think about how to create an implementation plan. Now this is going to be something that um, is going to be broken down per milestone essentially. So if you consider the plan, we'll have milestones. So for example, one of the milestones might be moving your fund on-premise fundraising software to a new, a, a new online fundraising software product, or moving from uh, your on-premise exchange server to exchange online, or moving your document management system to Office 365 or Box or something like that. Each one of those should be sort of handled as a separate project. And for each one of those, the, as you're moving through these, you'll, you'll have to create an implementation plan. And these are some guides. These, these, are, these are some things to consider when creating those <coughs> implementation plans. Um, so as I mentioned, these are some examples that, that are, you know, are, are real world examples of, of, of those plans. Uh, one of the m most important things I recommend to people do is to prioritize the transition efforts based on outcome cost risk assessments. So this is sort of a critical piece here. If, if you've got, you know, 10 different things, that 10, different, 10 different business functions that you're looking to migrate to the cloud over X amount of time, uh, you should have, assess which ones of those are the most risk. Um, for example, of, of providing business disruption in the near future. For example, maybe they're end of life. Maybe you're running short on server space. Um, maybe you're concerned about security. And, and then it's also, you, you may need to assess that against cost. Maybe some of the things that are the easiest to do um, maybe cost the most. So, and there isn't as budgeting for that and, and vice versa. Um, so there's, there's going to be sort of, and, and then some things may produce a tremendous amount of outcome and maybe pretty easy to knock off, and, and maybe that, that should be considered. So there's a sort of mapping of this over time, and that's why in that previous, in the Gantt chart I showed earlier, some of those things are lined up based on <clears throat> what, what we, I saw as being most critical. You know, the re, last, last year, as I mentioned, we transitioned to using our, our call center, using uh, Ring Central um, as a service as a cloud-based service because we saw our, our on-premise call center system starting to really indicate signs of failure and, and, and it was out of life in terms of the support um, from the vendors. So you know, that we, made that, we made a choice to, to do that ahead of some other things that, you know, um, that we're that now doing because we, we accomplished that. So the, the next point here is to, to map the business functions to current solutions and recommend, it, and recommend these solutions one by one seeking approvals and, and providing analysis of that solution determination at each each step. So, the the point here is that, you know, for the example that I gave about when we when we decided to move to our call center uh, from the on-premise solution we had to uh, Ring Central, that was presented as a, as its own sort of project, and I went through a a you know selection criteria matrix with the stakeholders where we sat down and we said, look at these different solutions. This is what they'll provide. Um, I saw it, you know, buy-in from them, and we we presented that at one, play, one at one time. I didn't present that, and then also the solution that we're going to do for document management and the solution we're going to do for the next project, all at the same time. We we're doing doing this in sort of bite-sized pieces so that it could be properly socialized and also that the analysis could focus on that. Now, understandably, sometimes we, we will have to do things in in parallel. But it, in terms of at least the uh, management of it, should be try to be concentrated on a per project per project basis. The next point is a very Im Im important one to take in consideration is is to look at uh, technical dependencies. And what I mean by that is that oftentimes 
because if you're moving from a world where the business functions are happening within the context of an information system or systems, moving one of those out away from that to the cloud may have implications in terms of the way that interacts or it's integrated with the systems that you're, you know, that were on premise, so to speak. And what I mean on premise, I mean the things that are, you know, within the confines behind your firewall or on your local area network or in servers in your server room to, um, you know, software as a service or to uh, infrastructure as a service environment. So for example, you may have, if you're thinking about moving your QuickBooks to, or your online QuickBooks to QuickBooks, you know, um, I'm sorry, QuickBooks on premise to QuickBooks online, there may be, you know, places where there's an integration with something in your on-premise file system. And so really have to go through that analysis to make sure that you're, you're, you know, you may want to move one system ahead of the other because that way it's there and, and able to communicate to the system that you're next migrating to the cloud. So you have to look at the way things are interoperating because it's very often the case that uh, organizations build integrations between their different systems, especially their financial and accounting systems, their donor soft, their donor systems. Um, you know, that's a very common one where there's going to be uh, uh, integrations with some of your other systems. Um, and the other thing is to understand how identity management changes when you move to the cloud um, and when you're creating a plan. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because um, I've seen some organizations, you know, start to leverage an online solution and then, you know, start using um, the way that they're authenticating to the online solution, the cloud-based system is using a non sort of corporate email address or something that then cannot be um, difficult to then on the onboarding and offboarding of, of individuals in the organization of access to those resources may be difficult to manage the authentication and authorization of what that user is doing online. So there are security considerations that have to be taken into place when thinking about moving to uh, cloud-based services. The next step is to get organizational buy-in. This is, this, is, this is really important. The, what we all want as technologists is that the solutions that we're developing for the organization to be successful, we want them to be adop adopted and we want to get maximum benefit from those solutions. The best way to do that is to get the buy-in of the users first and, and the organization so that when you're m transitioning those business functions to a new service, oftentimes it's going to be, it's going to be different than, than the way they were doing their work before. Um, and hopefully it will be because, you know, as, as I'm going to mention here, um, it's moving to the cloud is not just an upgrade or, a, or migration. It's really an opportunity for business transformation in, in terms of uh, uh, the way business works. So one of the things I recommend is that, that whoever's managing this, this in the organization is to really understand the approval process for the organization and understand who the primary stakeholders are. And if, if possible, create a, if you're the only sort of person you feel like you're a soldier out there advocating for, oh, we should do this, we should move to the cloud because you know, it's going to be so much better for the organization, but it may be falling on deaf ears. It might be good to consider uh, creating a technology advisory board from either with volunteers or board members to help support the, um, your efforts to, to, to move the organization to, um, to using technology more efficiently and effectively. Um, and the other thing I recommend is to align it with budgetary, budgetary processes. So uh, that way, if you're, you know, because of, like I mentioned earlier, there's changes to CapEx and OpEx modeling for the organization, it might be it's useful for this to happen when the, the finance and business leaders are looking at the, the pro, when they're projecting revenue and they're projecting expense, and then they can fit this in. So, and then as I mentioned earlier, it's really important to, to socialize this as transformational. It's not just an upgrade or a migration. We're not just migrating our email to Office 365. Uh, we're doing this because it's going to make, it's going to help people do their jobs better, faster, quicker, more securely. And um, it's also going to, uh, it's going to do something that I, that's called reduced technical debt. And I want to talk about that for a minute. Um, one of the best ways to socialize and get buy-in is to help people understand what, what, what te technical debt means. And technical debt 
is a term that refers to the consequence of, of putting at, purchasing or developing a, a huge, a, a, a large system or information systems that then will require maintenance, care and feeding, and and support with with you know with staff over over a period of time. So. Right now, for example, a lot of the work that we're doing to moving systems to the cloud is to reduce, is, is essentially we're paying, we're paying off our technical debt, essentially. We had made purchases and made decisions before there was cloud to invest in data centers, to invest in uh, the power systems, to invest in everything that underlies all the information systems um, that support a network, for example, the routers and switches. And, but that produces debt, and so, you know, what we're, kind of trying to do right now very much so is try to remove the technical debt in an organization by uh, having the systems that are managed on a day-to-day -day basis that require uh, this, this work and this expense to, to move to, to cloud-based systems where those are maintained and leveraged through a larger consortium of people who are in those data centers working those systems that are providing that. Um, and the other thing I really wanted, it's really important, is to stress security improvements. Um, the cloud is more secure um, than, you, and, and you know, the, it, for, and, 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 I, and I say this with a caveat that the cloud-based systems, for example, that are offered in our catalog, um, you know, Azure AWS, um, Office 365, Box, um, these are very, very highly secure systems, and they're going to be on top of things like GDPR. They're going to be on top of data privacy changes. They're going to be managing all that. So, um, so, so we as individual operations based technology technologists aren't in the position where we have to every time there's a change in privacy law we have to look at our systems or we're looking at PCI compliance we have to look at our systems and then um, add added functionality or upgrade our systems to to provide that um, and in terms of uh, data privacy issues that you know as I mentioned the you know Google Microsoft and you know Okta and and all the you know box Data privacy is first and foremost, you know, in, in, on their mind. They, they wouldn't have customers, enterprise-based customers, if that wasn't first on their mind. And so, I know, you know, 15 years ago when we were first looking at, you know, talking about the cloud, I, you know, I remember doing presentations where we're debating, you know, how secure is the cloud? You know, a lot of people felt at that time, and there, I'm sure there are people who still feel this way that I feel more secure about, you know, I know what, what's in my server room, and I feel like I know that's safe because I can see who's going in and out of it, but. Um, I think times have changed, and I think that we need to really understand that um, the cloud is safe and secure, and it's not impervious as we know, um, but it's 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 definitely better than if we try to build it ourselves. Um, work with vendors on providing demonstrations. Lastly, to get buy-ins, you know, it, it is helpful to have the people who are providing the service or the organization that's going to help you move to that transition, come in and talk about the product. They're the experts in the product. They, uh, yes, they're salespeople, but they also have an interest in, in helping you adopt and use that product. And, and they can provide some, and be there to answer questions directly to uh, other stakeholders in your organization. Okay, step four, go live strategy. Uh, this step is really about, you know, given that you've gone through these other, other three steps or somewhere in the process of those, and you're now in a place where you're going, okay, uh, we're ready to, we've actually done all the prep work, we've got the implementation plan, uh, we've got the resources, um, you know, how do we actually prepare for go live? So I know I've mentioned this before, but it's really important to provide ahead of time to the, the end users, the stakeholders, uh, training, documentation, and support guidelines ahead of the transition so that, and have them be part of that process. And um, we've done, I've done programs where we offered uh, initiatives for people who went through the webinars, went through the training, we provide them Starbucks gift cards or something basically to say, look, yeah, you know, I'm, 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 pr I'm prepared for this transition. Um, and oftentimes this is really necessary because you, what you don't want to have happen, especially if it's a hard cutover, uh, you don't want people to be, you know, all of a sudden going, oh no, I, you know, I don't know how to operate this business function. Um, and as part of that, one of the, one of the, uh, one of the steps of analysis that, that needs to occur is whether or not the transition can be 
a stage cutover, whether it could be performed in parallel or a hard cutover. And I want to talk about that just in a little bit because uh, this is an important aspect of transitioning um, a system over. There's for whatever, for depending on the actual function that's being migrated over, you you have choices here, and this, the and the importance of those choices is that it can reduce risk. Change does introduce risk in an organization. So, if you're moving, and, and sometimes it could provide anxiety as well for the people who are um, working in the organization. I mean, uh, change is hard. You know, change is not easy for people. And if somebody's been working and they've been doing their, they've been putting something and plugging something into a system every single day for the last. 10 years and now it's going to look different. There's going to be some, some, some adjustment there. So um, what, you know, it, sometimes it's helpful to say, okay, does it have, can we do a stage cutover? Can we, uh, can we do it in peril? Can we have both systems running at the same time? Now, sometimes that's, that's not possible. Generally with transaction-based systems, such as your financial system or an inventory management system, um, it's, it's, it's not practical to, to be operating in two worlds or even an email system. You probably don't want email going into two different boxes at one time. Um, however, what you can do is you can think about um, migrating team by team in the cases where it's something like email or it's something like document uh, management. So you can have one team move over. You could test it out with that team. You can, you can fail fast. You can learn. And then you can use those learnings as you move some of the other um, uh, teams over. It's also important to have a, a contingency plan. Uh, if possible, uh, and there should be always some, some sort of a contingency plan, what happens if, uh, if, if that doesn't work? Um, and you know, sometimes that could be uh, something as, it you know, could be something as easy of making sure that the systems that you had before are still up and running and that you can, if necessary, revert back to them. Uh, you know, we oftentimes will keep things turned on for quite a long period of time after transitioning just to ensure for a number of different reasons. Um, and even though I don't have a, a, a bullet point about this, one of the reasons why is because you may have to refer to information. Sometimes when you migrate from one system to another, if it's, there's data involved, you're not necessarily going to make the decision to move all the data at one time. You're going to say, I'm going to move the last three years' worth of data, and then, you know, because we have 15 years' worth of data, and the migration would just take too long if we were moving all 15 years. Well, let's keep, you know, 12 years in the, in the old system. We'll keep the system running if we have to refer back to that. But then you have to consider, you know, how you report year over year. But, but all these things are doable. Um, and it may be necessary for you only, only to be able to, to move the last three years' worth of data and then start, start from there. Uh, these are all the kinds of things that, that need to be considered. Um, and as I mentioned earlier is that, you know, generally when we talk about cloud migration, we're talking about moving business functions to the cloud, at least when it comes to sort of internal IT migrations. If you, if you, if you have websites as part of your um, uh, business model uh, or your, as part of the, you know, how you provide impact to, the, um, uh, to your community, you may have websites uh, and, you know, if you were hosting those websites yourself and you're moving from the cloud, um, that may be, you know, to, to for example, Internet is uh, moving to Amazon Web Service, for example. That, that may be something different, but mostly we're, you know, it's, it's the, the types of things the types of migrations that I see with organizations are, you know, moving to Office 365, moving to their document repository online to SharePoint or to Box, moving to uh, using single sign-on with Okta, using uh, moving to QuickBooks, uh, moving these sort, of, moving to Salesforce, uh, moving to an online fundraising system. These are things that are internal business functions primarily, and so e my recommendation is to treat each one of those business functions separately and manage it end to end if possible um, with those stakeholders and, and, and not have it be part of a larger thing to move you know, three different business functions at one time. The last step I'm going to discuss is, involves sort of what we would consider sort of assessment and iteration. So this is, of course, many of you have probably seen this, the plan, do, act, check, deming cycle. 
um, where, you know, this is, this is continuous. Uh, you know, I, I advocate that organizations be learning organizations and such that we're always sort of reevaluating and reassessing um, the landscape in terms of what is it that, the, you know, from a technology perspective, we know technology changes. We know it changes it's changing more and more rapidly every day. Um, as such, you know, we've seen sort of, as I mentioned earlier through this talk, we've seen sort of, we've seen how that cycle has shortened from what used to be sort of, you know, probably before I started doing this, probably 10-year cycles or 20-year cycles to, to five-year cycles when I became really actively involved. And now, you know, I'm seeing it, you know, as short as 18 months. Um, and, and, these are the, and the reason is, is because we have an ability to really leverage cloud infrastructure to develop services and apps and things that help businesses change the way they do things. There's things that we don't know exactly what 12 months now somebody will develop, such as a, a new type of you know, Slack or some new type of way that people work within business um, or do business. Um, business, you know, at a high level, you know, if I was to say what is the largest trend that I've seen and, and why this is so important is that we're seeing things broken down in technology into discrete services. And so we're able to pick and cho choose each service we want and the best tool for each service. Whereas 15, 20 years ago, what we would see is sort of, you know, a monolithic solution that would have, you know, each one of the services as a bundle or you pay for add-ons or modules within that large monolithic system. So you'd have, um, and not, not, I'm not want to name any vendors, but you'd have a large nonprofit financial vendor you'd buy the base product, and then you could buy additionally you know, these modules, and these were on-premise modules that would then fit in with your monolithic uh, system. What we're seeing with cloud-based services now is that we're seeing all these things broken up. You could have a separate system just for payment processing. You can have that, that will integrate with web services to a separate system that just does the, the fundraising, to a separate system that does the actual customer management like Salesforce. And within Salesforce, you could have within Salesforce different services that are apps within that that then provide discrete services within, with, within that sort of framework. Um, and so what that's enabled us to do as solution providers for organizations is to essentially choose from this menu and at, at a minimum, that's, assess those regularly to, to understand if, if, there's, if there's, there's something newer that's less expensive that actually provides a better job. And as we have things in the cloud, transitioning from one to the other is easier and easier as well because the data is more normalized and standardized um, because we, 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 we didn't make all the, we didn't have the capacity, ability to make all the customizations that we used to love to do with those monolithic systems. So um, sometimes it's, it's painful moving first, transitioning from an on-premise system that has been uh, like, you know, within an organization for 10 years because there were so many customizations to the data. And now we're having to normalize that data to move to something that's an on-premise, you know, version of, the, I mean, a, a cloud-based version of that. However, once you do that, moving to the next cloud-based version is going to be easier because it's unlikely that you would have made a whole bunch of customizations to the data schema, for example, of that. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, I, I know I've, it, I've said this over and over again, but it's, it's best reevaluate tools and, and work in these cycles. And then the other thing is to document the best practices. As you, as you start working with these tools, um, ensure that there's places for people to share the best practices. Look online for best practices because we always, you know, can, can leverage. Now that and that's one of the benefits of working in the cloud is because, you know, unlike sort of a homegrown customized solution that may have been developed where your subject matter experts, you know, are the people who, who kind of worked with uh, uh, people to customize that software, now everybody in the community is using that same version of that same software. And you can leverage the, um, the knowledge bases and the wikis associated with that and learn from a whole bunch of other organizations about how to do that. And so, you know, as, you know, just to share a few of, uh, uh, historically, um, even prior coming to TechSoup, uh, my favorite uh, places to, uh, where I found inspiration for keeping on top of the trends uh, was through N10, Idealware, and TechSoup. And so um, with that, um, I think we're, we can move on to, uh, to questions. All right. Thank you, Michael. So um, if you guys have questions, feel free to use the chat box, and uh, Michael has a few minutes to answer them. So I'm going to go ahead. We had a couple come in 
while you're speaking, so I'm going to go ahead and start with those. So uh, Michael, can you tell us, um, somebody was asking about cloud services that are um, HIPAA and I guess it's called FERPA compliant. Um, is a server the only way to go in that case when it comes to that type of data? That, that's a great question. The, you know, when you're evaluating the software tools, um, because of the focus right now on data privacy, the, the services that are going to be um, HIPAA and, and compliant with um, sort of uh, you know, user rights management and user data management are, are going to explicitly um, have that in, in, their, uh, in, in, in their documentation. Um, I, do, I would like to say specifically regarding uh, Office 365 suite um, that you can you know, purchase through TechSoup. When looking at that, if that's a necessity, um, you know, it, it is important to understand that, for example, the E5, the E3 and E5 um, versions of, of Exchange Online, for example, are the only ones that can provide that level of compliance, and, um, and not just the generic e, E1 licensing. And because there's, there's certain, um, and, and, but that's really spelled out, and, and our customer service agents can help you with that, and also can answer questions about other products and services that you have that are in our marketplace. But that's a very good question. And, you know, and I, that is one trend that I'm seeing is more and more emphasis on ensuring that uh, not just for HIPAA, but also just for uh, uh, general um, you know, data privacy requirements. Got it. Perfect. Um, so we had a question earlier. This is just a basic 101 um, ERP you mentioned. Can you uh, explain, one, what that stands for, and two, uh, what that exactly is? I apologize um, for the use of acronyms. And, uh, and, and we've uh, been actually trying not, not to use acronyms as much because they are becoming less and less meaningful. Uh, ERP originally you know, stands for Enterprise Resource Planning. Um, management system. Uh, and so uh, traditionally, an, your ERP system would uh, have the, would provide the business functions of your financial accounting, um, also inventory management, uh, sometimes in, you know, larger organization manufacturing. Uh, essentially, the, you know, these are large, large tools like SAP or Microsoft Dynamics, um, uh, uh, exact acts would be ERP solutions. Uh, a NetSuite um, uh, is in, you know, technically we, we call that in technical terms an ERP solution because it provides all that, it provides a lot more, uh, but that at its core, it provides those business functions. So. Perfect. Thanks for the uh, explanation. Um, so when it comes to technology debt, how do you help colleagues understand that there are still costs associated with maintenance of cloud services, um, in other words, they aren't just set it and forget it. That's another good question. Uh, there is, you know, if you're um, if you're leveraging, for example, if you're if if the way that you're working with cloud services, for example, using AWS, and you're bringing up instances in in, in Amazon Web Services to to actually create servers in the cloud, and then installing software on those servers, those servers still need to be patched and maintained um, over time. It is not, as you said, a, a set it and forget it. And it, however, that being said, m more and more uh, Amazon Web Services and Microsoft Azure are providing many of the things that are needed by those type of traditional boxes, as we call them, through services themselves that then would provide, be provided. It's not still quite as set it and forget it because of the need for monitoring and for ensuring that, that the data still needs to be backed up. But there are benefits to moving from, um, for example, just you know, bringing up, and, and not, all, not all the time you can do this because you may, have, it may need to be installed software. So what I'll do is I'll differentiate, and one of the ways that I'll communicate this is that I'll say, uh, installed, installed software is installed software. It, it doesn't matter if it's installed on a box in your in your data cabinet, and if it's, it's but if it's installed in in a box in the cloud, yes, you don't have to worry about the technical debt of, for example, the power supply or the network switching environment. But you still have the technical debt of ensuring that that system is patched, 
that is provided with um, OS updates, that there's vulnerability scanning that's happening on it, and there's um, – and so it's – it. So my recommendation, if that's the, the model by which you're leveraging cloud resources, and, and even, if it, even if they are just purely services, there would still be um, uh, the debt associated to, to, to the maintenance, and especially on monitoring and, and, and patching and vulnerability scanning and security, and ensure that there's not being breached or either that, that security instances are occurring. Um, however, they are less um, and they're less over time, and they actually the iterations and the cycles, and, you, and oftentimes that could be managed on a more, on a, you know, on a less uh, sort of you, you can budget for those a little bit easier generally than than if you are hit every five years with a large sort of oh I've got to get, I've got to you know change out all these UPSs all these battery backups and we've got to do a complete rebuild of our HVAC system in our server room or something like that so. Um, so it's it's it is a reduction, um, but it's you're you're right. It's it's not just you know we're in the cloud now, so hooray, we don't have to do anything. All right. So somebody's asking in you know in the situation where um, there's a disaster, uh, they said big quake or zombie a cop, a cop, uh, apocalypse. <laughs> sorry. Um, so while power or connectivity might be less if there if it's not available. In that situation, um, are there recommended methods to back up data um, while the Internet is down? Um, so if you have any recommendations on you know, if you are in the cloud and, and something like that happens, what is your recommendation? If, if the data is in the cloud, and depending on the cloud service provider, and, the, and depending, depending on the way it was architected in the cloud, and um, I think that's that's going to depend on sort of some of those facets. If it's um, because assuming that the the data centers where they're at are are they have redundancy built into that, then um, you, you may you may have protection there built in based on if it's um, for example, if when we're developing um, if we're actually developing instances in Azure or in Microsoft, we'll have we'll use what. Our, Availability zones where we'll have uh, instances set up in different availability zones. They can fail over to one just in case something happens to that particular data center. Um, now, if you're if you're talking about, and I'm not quite sure, maybe clarification is if you're talking about on on premise data, meaning that you've had a failure, or you need, or maybe you need to access data, but you can't get to the internet. So, how do you access the data if you don't have access to the internet? Maybe I can get a clarification on that. Okay, so we'll wait for that uh, clarification there. Um, so the, I think they said if the Internet is down um, or to restore, should the service provider encounter major damage? Does that help? Yes, you know, it is, it is you know, it, there is, you know, service providers and there is, um, Okay, thanks. I've got some clarification. Basically, imagine there's a blackout over a quarter of the U.S. And we did have a situation happen not too long ago where um, we had a, an outage uh, of, a, of, a, of a whole bunch of data centers, um, and uh, and so it, it cut out services. I you know for and a lot of people probably most significantly noticed it when they were trying to watch Netflix, and you know they couldn't they couldn't they couldn't watch their favorite Netflix shows. But for, if you were operating a business and your your data was in that data center. Um, it, it's, um, it, it's, I imagine that a lot of the people were very nervous about the quality of the data or what was happening to the data that was in those data centers. Um, just because your data is in a data center, you know, you're working in an on-premise solution, it is very important that you have a, a, a DR strategy in place. So what my recommendation is, is that if you have mission critical data and it's, for example, um, then and, it, and, and, you, it, and it's in the cloud, and maybe this is your uh, customers. Um, and you know, the important thing with that is that is that if you're going to move data around and you're going to store it, it it's absolutely it, you know important to to ensure that the transmission of the data and the storage of the data is encrypted, even if it's for a DR uh, solution. So um, I do recommend that if you're working with an online um, solution, a, a service provider. 
and they, they're providing a, um, um, you know, and you have your, your data there, and this data is critical to your mission that you have a disaster recovery um, that you periodically, depending on, you know, what we would call your service level agreement, what you, what you, you know, what you would expect, you know, would be in a worst case scenario that if you, you know, that half the core of the U.S. went out because of a major earthquake, what would you minimally need in order to continue for, you know, from a business continuity expense uh, perspective, what would you minimally need in order to operate business, especially if you're in a position where your mission is so critical to the, the community. When, uh, as an example, when I worked at Second Harvest Food Bank, uh, we were, this was top of mind for us because we had, you know, we were sitting on warehouses filled with food, and, and if there was an earthquake that hit the, the Bay Area, we needed to be able to be in communication with other service providers locally. So we, were, we, we, went, we went to the extreme of, of becoming ham, uh, radio operators because we couldn't guarantee that Wi-Fi service would be there and we would need to be able to communicate with the Red Cross and local municipalities in order to understand where we needed to distribute food that was in our warehouse before it was spoiled. Um, so to that extent, we thought about, for example, what we did is we, what I did is I looked at what is the most important data that I need to, to, for the business to operate to get food out to people, and I made sure that I had local copies of that data and some facility to be able to render that data into a usable form. However, um, that was, it was a minimal set of information um, and it, just in order to get through whatever crisis and also to, to restore business to the activity that we needed, and then so that until we can resume that. And we actually went through a planning process and exercises to demonstrate that. So, but as I mentioned, one of the benefits of cloud technology is that m these service providers, the data is encrypted. It's, you know, it, it's, ex it's accessible, um, not even by the people who are providing the data themselves, only to the people who are authorized to, to access the data. And it's encrypted and it's transmitted using encrypted protocols. If you're going to have local copies of your data, you have to be, for compliance reasons, equally as uh, responsible in terms, of, in terms of that data that you're maintaining on premise if, if that's what you need to do to ensure uh, business continuity in the event of a major event. I hope that helps. Yeah, that, that definitely helps. I think um, you know, uh, in terms of like disaster response or like being on site, um, if there's an organization on, on the call that has to actually go to the you know, area where there is a disaster, and then if there's volunteer forms or things like that, and they don't have access to cloud-based services, um, does that, I guess, do you have any recommendations around that? Yeah, you know what? Those are really good questions, and we've, um, uh, you know, I've worked with organizations that have had to, you know, thought through this, and I think it's really um, important to, th to think through that. I've, uh, there are facilities to um, work with data locally um, on notebooks. I don't think, I think you're right. You shouldn't assume going into a, a situation where you're providing support and disaster support that, um, that you would have access to the cloud when, um, you know, a, a case in point, when Katrina happened, um, it, you know, I had the um, I had the uh, opportunity to volunteer to for the uh, for Feeding America and go out to the area and help restore services for the local lo the food bank the local food banks there. And we I didn't make any assumptions about what what data was going to be there. Um, so I you know I brought you know and the first task I had out there was to restore internet connectivity for. Uh, uh, for the food bank um, and, and also a few other warehouses that we were, we were spinning up. But we also, I had local copies of the, um, and, and I, I wouldn't assume anything. So what I did is I had some tools, you know, essentially went back to sort of old school technology about working in, in spreadsheets and working and, and, and having ways to, to collect information on a local laptop. And then, but it was, you know, encrypted. And so you can encrypt things on a hard drive on, on your laptop. and and make sure that you're, you're, you have some um, security in place in your laptop because especially in a situation like that, your, your device can be compromised and you wouldn't want um, if it was in information that you need and it was sensitive information, if it had people's personal, personally identifiable information, you wouldn't want that to be jeopardized. So, um, but those technologies are easy. Uh, another example um, that I have is when I was working uh, once again from, at the food bank, we 
would go into service areas and sign people up for, for food stamps. And so we had teams of people going out in a van, and they'd, they'd, they'd sign people up for food stamps, and they had had laptops. And what we did, to my point, is that we, you know, we, we didn't know if necessarily where they went, they'd have access. You know, we, they'd go out with the hotspot, but we didn't know if that, you know, the, the church or the school that they were at had access to the Internet. So we would um, we'd essentially provide the capacity. We, we, we encrypted folders on the hard drive, and we had sort of forms made that could sort of just take that data and do what we call store and forward. So you could store the data temporarily in an encrypted drive on your box, and then in some fashion that makes it then portable. And then when you get into a place where you have Internet, that you could upload that and batch that information and create scripts to batch that information and forward it. And if you're thinking about this, um, if you do that work ahead of time, then it will save you trying to figure it out in the last minute because it's an emergency and a crisis. So it's a real, very good question, and, and I appreciate that because I think it is an important thing to think about. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so I think we have uh, just a few minutes left. So uh, I just want to um, you know, close out a few items before uh, we go offline here. So um, before we go, if you guys could just um, share one thing that you learned in today's webinar in the chat. It's really fun for Michael, Lashika, and myself to, to hear your feedback. Um, we also have a post-event survey, so if you have any feedback for us, um, you should receive that once you log off the webinar and also in the follow-up emails. If you're on social media, we love social media love. So Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, give us a like, follow, and heart. I think those are the, the things that you can do on those, those platforms. Um, and then also we have our blog. So visit us at uh, blog.techsoup.org for tips and tricks and how-tos and things like that. Um, and then we have a webinar coming up on 626. Uh, Lashika is actually going to be hosting that one, Excel Made Easy for Beginners. And uh, just lastly, I would like to thank Michael for the awesome webinar and Lashika for doing the technical assistance on the back end. And thank you to you guys for attending and spending your time with us today. And we'll see you soon. <laughs>